Uh, first of all, let me thank Scott. Uh, Scott is uh, one of the people in the business who really knows what's going on. And part of the reason why was because he sat in the back of the car and got shot at. Uh, um, um, and I, 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 I mean that uh, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, I know that for police, having been there can cover a multitude of sins. And that is when a police officer said you had to be there to understand, uh, it, you have to be alert to what that really means. But in one sense, it's true. You have to be there to understand. And for those of you who uh, uh, have read uh, the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, when he describes a shooting in New York City uh, and the details that went into that shooting, a tragic sh shooting in which an innocent man was killed with 40 shots being fired, but his account of the details uh, uh, really uh, uh, um, emphasizes uh, the need to be there. That's the first introduction. The second introduction is that what Scott says about the uh, school is true. It's a school in the make. Uh, those of us who are at, at Rutgers, et cetera, watch as, as Scott uh, uh, climbs the ladder, uh, steals our faculty. Uh, Damien Martinez is still uh, uh, stolen, uh, gets our, our, some of our best uh, students. Uh, 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 um, and uh, uh, it, it truly is a school that we're watching uh, develop. And uh, you can be very proud of it, those of you who are here. Uh, part of it is Scott's own reputation. Uh, he, um, uh, uh, as I said, he's, he's been there. Uh, his work on gangs and in other areas is considered to be uh, uh, standard for the field. Uh, the, uh, third the third introductory comment that I want to make is that for those of you who heard me last time, I want to make an apology. I'm going to go over some of the same materials. I want to add to it at the beginning and add to it at the end to get a fuller picture, but you'll have to forgive me. Uh, but I'm used to saying that, especially to students, because I think in terms of war stories. Uh, I, I, I tend not to think much as, as much logically as from events and experiences. And so I tell students, the first time I tell a war story, of course, I hope you find it entertaining. The second time I tell a war story over, I expect you to listen and be polite. The third time I tell a war story over, I expect at that time you're going to say, hey, uh, George, we've heard that before. Uh, uh, I, Damien might be the only person in the room, maybe Justin Reedy as well, who might have heard some of my war stories for three times. But I will be telling some war stories as, as we move ahead. And I apologize to those who have, uh, who have heard me. Um, but uh, 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 um, uh, Scott raised several times the issue of, of age. Um, I started my professional practice during the 1950s. I graduated from college in 1956. Uh, started, uh, I w went to school beyond that. I went to seminary for a couple of years. And while in the seminary, I started to work part time in a detention home for juveniles. And that ultimately led to a career in social work. I thought I was going to be in social work all my career. And by accident, got, got, involved, got involved in criminal justice. But that, that means I was born in 1935. I grew up in a very different world that nobody in this room, I don't think anyone in this room, has come close to experiencing. And that was a world in which people weren't really much concerned about crime. Uh, bus drivers carried change. Homes had milk chutes, uh, flimsy doors uh, that you wouldn't dream of having now. Uh, the keys were not, the, the doors weren't double locked. You had these uh, uh, funny looking keys that they don't even make anymore. Uh, my parents didn't worry about me when I went out and played uh, at, at, at night, even when I was 10 and 11 years old, because they knew when the lights went out on the playground, I'd come home. Uh, it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't an issue. And I've thought a lot about that. I suppose as you do get older, you, uh, you start to think about both ends uh, in more detail. And again, Scott mentioned uh, both ends as, uh, as, he was, uh, as he was talking. And, and the question, I've been a lot involved in answering the question, why did crime decline so much during the 1990s and into the uh, 21st century? 
And as you know, and as many of you know, there's been a big debate about that. I've been an active partisan in that because I was very much involved in New York City and I was very much involved in Los Angeles. And now I'm pleased to hear Scott mention Milwaukee because I continue to be involved in Milwaukee where they've had particular difficulties in trying, uh, trying to explain, uh, explain, those, uh, uh, explain those difficulties. But the question that I, I've been recently addressing is what happened that things got out of control? What happened that my children were the first generation that began to experience the levels of fear and concern about crime? That, that, that it was an integral part of how we built our homes, the lifestyles that we lived, how we shopped, the locks on cars, the automatic locks on cars. Just think of all of the things in your world that um, uh, um, chains that thick so you can't get wire cutters to lock up bicycles. What happened for those changes to occur? And um, it seems to me answering that question is more than an academic enterprise. Because answering that question might give us some clues as to now that we've had the benefits of reduced crime, how do we, how, how do we keep crime down? And especially how do we keep crime down uh, given the economic chaos or difficulties, chaos is too strong of a word, the, maybe not for some states, but the economic difficulties with which are not confronted because it is real, and these, these guys are coming out of prisons regularly, and I use guys, guys advisedly, and Scott is uh, right to alert us to that. And the, the argument that I'm developing, that I'm working on, which I don't think is very unique, is that if during the 1950s and 1960s, we set out to destroy institutions of social control, we could not have done a better job. Whether it was the school or churches or neighborhoods, we couldn't have done a better job. Scott mentioned zoning. For those of you, and I hope all of the graduate students here, all of the students here, maybe all of you, have read Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. The second chapter is The Uses of Streets. You can't be educated in this business without having read that. It is simply the classic. J-A-C-O-B-S, Jacobs, Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. When I was a boy, I lived on the northwest side of Milwaukee. I, I lived basically in a German neighborhood. Uh, you couldn't go in any direction where I lived in that German neighborhood for more than two or three blocks without running into a tavern, a butcher shop, a drugstore, and uh, you know, at that point, I'd go with my if I if I was wealthy and had a nickel, I'd, I could get an ice cream cone for that. Can you imagine that? A penny, I could still get candy. A quarter would get me a chocolate malted milk. But they knew me in the drugstore, and they knew my playmates. Think of what think of what happened as a result of single-use zoning. And that is, when my parents moved from that initial place in Northwest, uh, farther out in Northwest after the zoning had changed, we couldn't no, we, I could no longer walk to a drugstore. My father couldn't walk to the corner tavern. The car had to be used. Think of what that zoning meant in terms of people who had an economic interest, who had a citizen's interest in keeping control over a neighborhood. The owner of that drugstore, the owner of that bar, it was a neighborhood bar. This was, the German, this was a German style and a German tradition. I said last night uh, to Dan when we were talking, I can still remember when there was free food in the bar. I, I wasn't able to buy it at this price, but, it, but, but, a, but a beer and schnapps was 15 cents. But again, you had these interests of controlling the streets. And I bothered one time to list uh, what I think well-intentioned social policies that undermine social control. And again, I emphasize well-intentioned. Maybe, maybe not all the time. Because it isn't very, you don't have to dig very deep to find race penetrating these policies. But 
Scott mentioned zoning. That's number one on mine. Urban renewal. Think of what we did to neighborhoods in the name of urban, or urban renewal. In Milwaukee, in one area, simply 1,700 houses were demolished. They were replaced by 240 housing units. Redlining of neighborhoods started by the federal government where they wouldn't loan money anymore. Blockbusting, real estate agents coming in and saying, hey, you, you know that African Americans, and they wouldn't use that term, but do you know that African Americans are moving into the next block and we'll buy your house right now? The centralization of services, the movement of courts downtown, police moving downtown, prosecutors moving downtown, tower block construction, uh, St. Louis, uh, 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 Scott could tell us about that. Public housing, 13, 15 stories high. The Robert Taylor homes in Chicago, over two miles of high rise after high rise after high rise in which we stored the poorest, most troubled families. Busing, in the name of integration, we decided to bus people and we gave up on neighborhood schools. And, and what happened as a result? I know my mother and father, when they first took me to school, they were very concerned about the safety going back and forth to school from traffic more than anything else, but they wanted to make sure that it was safe for me to go to school. We lost that. The, the deinstitutionalization of the emotionally disturbed, including violent people. Uh, again, the abuse in state hospitals was, was enormous, but in the name of abuse, uh, decriminalization of, of, of many minor offenses, uh, what we did in schools, what we did to family authority. Uh, an example, when I, I worked in the juvenile court as a probation officer before the, uh, before the Galt decisions in the 1950s and 1960s, and I, I revisited in the, middle, in the middle 1980s. And what I discovered is, if I had a son in 1985 who stole a car in Wisconsin, My response to him as his parent would be, George, I want you to admit that you did this, and I want you to pay the consequences. I would have no standing. If I wouldn't get a lawyer to plead my son innocent, the court would appoint an attorney who would plead my son innocent. I had no standing as a parent. Again, what was the intention, of course, was to keep juveniles from being abused by a criminal justice apparatus that may, or juvenile justice apparatus that wasn't working very well. But once again, my authority as a parent was undermined. So here we had all of these social policies uh, and added to it during the 1960s, we had the rights revolution. And I, I won't go into detail about that. You're all aware of what happened during the 1960s. Many of you have had to read it, many of you experienced it, and that is we started to emphasize rights over responsibility. Now, there's some really good news out of this. The good news is that the rights revolution gave us a lot of freedoms that we didn't have before, but the best news is most kids simply were unaffected by this. Most kids brought up, still respectful, worked hard in school, obeyed the law, but for a small percentage, Pandora's box was open. And I'm, I'm certain the academics here can tell you, many of you know, but you, you know these two cohort studies. The first one with a cohort uh, of, of, of youths first research in 1945 by Marvin Wolfgang, and this startling, and I, I'll make this statistic up, it'll be close, this startling statistic that 5% or 6% of the juvenile offenders commit 50% of the crime. And that was replicated, uh, what, what, what was it, a 1958 cohort was that? Replicated with a 1958 co uh, cohort, and basically the statistics were the same. 6% of the offenders committed 50% of the offenses, except there was one big difference. And that is the crimes that they were committing, they were committing more crimes, and they were committing more serious crimes. And that was the bad news that came out of what I consider to be the breakdown of social control. Now, most of you know that my work has been primarily with the police, but I come out of a juvenile justice background, out of a detention home background. I ran a psychiatric hospital for, uh, 
emotionally disturbed and aggressive children for a period of time. So my comments that, I, I, uh, that I'm going to continue to make, I think will primarily apply to police. But I don't think it takes much to make them relevant to prosecutors, to probation and parole, to courts, and at times I will do that myself, especially, uh, especially regarding prosecutors. Uh, because as some of you know, uh, my wife and I have done some research into prosecution and looked into, com into community prosecution. So with that rather long introduction, uh, I, I want to make the following comment about police. Because there was also something else that occurred. And that is that police entered, came out of the 1950s, supremely confident that they had found the means of controlling crime and controlling police inside a police department. And O.W. Wilson was the model for this. And for those of you who are in policing, who have been in policing more than 20 years, you know that when you studied civil service exams, you memorized O.W. Wilson's police administration, Wilson and McLaren, uh, because all the questions had been asked about policing and all the answers had been given regarding policing with the strategies and tactics laid out by O.W. Wilson and the International City Management Management Association. The, the problem, that didn't mean that people weren't aware that there were problems in policing. Uh, and the primary concern up, up through the 1930s, 40s, 50s was the level of abuse in criminal investigation. Uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm blocking, uh, I'll, I'll have several senior moments uh, during this presentation. Uh, don't worry about it. I've, I've had them since I was 13. Uh, and, and every time, <laughs> but, but, but what was the uh, 1930s report? The, uh, uh, the Wilking, the W, uh, what was, the Wickersham report. Remember, notice I remembered the W. But don't worry, I'm not putting my car keys in the refrigerator yet. Um, the, the Wickersham report, report pointed it out quite clearly. And that was the primary means of criminal investigation was torture. And those of us who watched the old uh, noir movies of the 1930s and 40s will remember the third degree. And that was, and you go back even farther, and I saw the pictures uh, with, this, uh, with this gentleman who was uh, uh, from the IMF uh, with his collar, with his white shirt, and his tie off. There, in the early 20th century, there was a New York City police commissioner that said, when somebody was brought in with a white shirt, he wanted to see blood on it. Uh, so, uh, it, it, I, I mean, the, uh, the level of, of, of professionalism in policing let a lot, left a lot to be desired, but a primary problem was, uh, was uh, a torture in uh, criminal investigations. And of course, that resulted in the Supreme Court decisions of the 1950s uh, that basically said, look, if you're gonna give us contaminated evidence, we simply won't accept it and we've seen a reformation in terms of criminal investigation, et cetera. But that was the first big hit at policing. The second big hit were, were the riots of the 1960s. And uh, those of you who are old enough to recall will, will recall how stunning this was. Uh, in Milwaukee, uh, where I lived at the time, uh, to see uh, military personnel carriers going through the streets was something that I never anticipated that I'd see, and I hope I never see again. But the African American community said, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be policed this way. And it didn't matter whether the police were called or whether the police, uh, it was self-initiated. Uh, every, every incident, every major riot in the United States started with an interaction between police and an African American citizen who was, who was protesting in one fashion or another, and the communities exploded. So that was the second big hit. The third big hit was despite the fact that police in, in virtually every city with their confidence said, if I can have X more police, I can keep crime under control. And you know, in Kansas City it was 325, and New York it was you know, another number, but there was this kind of confidence. But it didn't matter what police did. Uh, crime continued to rise, started to rise during the 1960s, and that rise persisted through the 1980s into the 1990s. There's some wavering, but basically the, the trend was up. And then the final hit came during the 1970s when we started to do research into policing. And it turned out that there was no evidence that riding around in cars 
prevented anything. The, the idea was that if police rode around in cars, you could create a feeling of omnipresence, that omnipresence would deter the bad guys. It turns out that you could pull police or add police cars, and nobody knew the difference, and so uh, the evidence of its deterrent value was nil. Uh, and then on top of that, and that was less surprising than the research into rapid response for calls for service. And what virtually everyone knows now, but it doesn't seem often to affect much policy, is that organizing police departments around responding to calls for service uh, is extremely low in payoff. And to use a, free, a phrase that I've used for some years, the con one consequence is that it de-polices city streets. Because as you try and reduce response time, you've got to keep police in cars available to respond to calls for service. And so there's a con conundrum there in terms of it's very low payoff, but it's become politically uh, a, a, a very difficult to try and deal, deal with that problem. So you get to the end of the 1970s in policing. And policing is looking for its core competence. And American policing is completely defeated. And if any of you were around at that time, you'll remember uh, in integrated criminal apprehension programs, which conceptually was fine but didn't go anyplace. Uh, there was this general sense of nothing working. Uh, but at, at, at the same time, police departments working with lone wolves like uh, Herman Goldstein, Larry Sherman, me, other people, were starting to develop some ideas. And these, this is what I talked about last time I was here, and I want to go through these very quickly. They identified five, or over the period, five big ideas developed that reshaped American policing and set up what happened in the 1990s. The first big idea was Herman Goldstein working with the Madison Police Department. And that idea was something, and, and, and let me make an introductory comment, uh, 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 an introductory comment that isn't meant to uh, uh, win the hearts and minds of police officers here. Uh, every idea developed in local police departments and every idea developed with, uh, um, with people like Herman or me working with line officers. Uh, and Herman, familiar, like Scott in the back seat, Herman was in the back seat, I was in the back seat, and these other people were in the back seat. And uh, I'll say this, and I don't know whether I'll, I'll have time to go through this. I've been involved in a lot of problem-solving projects. There is not a one in which the major ideas have not come out of line patrol officers. Uh, and I, I'm not attempting to, to patronize uh, in, in any sense line police officers. But what, but, but what Herman described was what every police officer would tell you. And, and, and that is, just as a small percentage of offenders are committing a major number of offenses, cops knew that. So a, a small number of, of addresses, of residences, were calling the police regularly. And what Herman said, you know, police are organized around incidents, when as a matter of fact, the incidents most often are signs of problems. And so the implicit question in that, if, it's, if that's the case, and it turns out it is, then why are you waiting for an incident? Why aren't you doing something about the problem to begin with? Now that's a major shift in thinking. That's a big idea. And all of the evidence since, whether we talk about place-based policing or whether we talk about perpetrator-oriented policing, has as its roots the idea that problems are out there and we ought to be being concerned about the problems and that it's appropriate for police, prosecutors, probation and parole to be concerned about the problems as well as the particular incidents. And we can maybe give some examples of that later. The second big idea, and this, I'm, I apologize, this is a sign of, as I've said last time, this is a sign of my humility. The, the second big idea was broken windows. Uh, Herman's article, first article on problem solving was written in 1978. Uh, um, uh, broken Windows was written in 1982. And Broken Windows, as m most, many of you know, is a metaphor. It says that just as, just as uh, if, if a window is broken and, and is left untended, it's a sign that nobody cares and leads to more broken windows. Uh, we certainly know that that's true. Uh, likewise, if disorderly conditions or 
uh, behavior is left untended, it's a sign that nobody cares, and leads to fear of crime, more serious crime, and uh, urban decay. Uh, as you know, that's been a controversial idea. It's not very controversial in policing. Uh, uh, it's been bastardized in a variety of forms. Uh, uh, the phrase zero tolerance I find objectionable because it smacks of zealotry and because zero tolerance, except for limited time and limited space, there's no such thing as zero tolerance. Because if you were to uh, send the Phoenix Police Department out tomorrow and say stop every, every offense, make an arrest, you wouldn't have any police on the streets. Uh, because at, uh, um, at 32 miles an hour in a 30 zone, uh, nine out of 10 cars you'd be stopping, arresting, et, et cetera. So zero tolerance really became a pejorative phrase uh, in opposition uh, to the ideas of broken windows. I won't defend them here. Uh, um, the ideas have spread from, from policing to prosecution to probation and parole to medicine to teaching to nursing to, to, to you name it. Uh, um, um, it's, but it has penetrated policing and it says, and criminal justice and it says that minor offenses matter. And I, I won't go into details about that. The third big idea perhaps is the most basic idea. And, and, and that is it's based upon an idea that we live in a democracy. And in a, democ a democracy puts forward the idea that citizens can govern themselves. And we view that as self-evident. It's a basic human right. It follows from that if people can govern themselves, they can police themselves. And the Anglo-Saxon model of policing is an attempt to preserve as much as possible in a more complicated world than the agrarian society, the pre-1800s, uh, is to preserve a model of, of policing locally through surrogates. And that's why in the United States, which is the most radically decentralized police department, we maintain the value of small cities, each city having their own police department. There are some there are examples of that not being the case, but for the most part, People want to control their police department. And what this means is that what we discovered as a result of the riots, what we discovered in a variety of other ways, that people have to give consent to be governed. They have to consent to be policed effectively. And not just consent, but to solve problems, police need partners. They need collaboration. And this idea that it was not only of value to get consent of citizens, but it was a utilitarian argument that to be effective, because just as all good ideas, all good ideas that I've had access to, including broken windows, which Smitty taught me on, taught me on, on the streets of Newark, uh, 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 and, and there I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought a minute, but it'll come back. But anyway, the, the, the general point that I'm making is about broken windows, minor offenses, et cetera, and excuse me. Um, uh, I'll move beyond that particular, uh, I'll move beyond that particular point. Oh, I, I know what I was saying about collaboration. And, 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 and that is that not only do we need the good ideas, but we need partnerships. Squeegee men was solved with the collaboration of the prosecutor's office. Uh, you can't think of solving the problem of homicide in Newark without the involvement of social agencies. Uh, you simply need partners and you need, and, and you need the community. So the first big idea was problems, the second broken windows, the third was uh, consent and collaboration. The fourth big idea was pulling levers and that David Kennedy, uh, um, who's now at John Jay, was involved in developing and that idea was that the bad guys are really bad and they commit a lot of offenses. And it turns out that everyone knows who they are. Uh, and I've done this in, in some cities. If, if I ask the prosecutors to get together, the police to get together, probation and parole, and make out a list of who are the people who are really tearing this town apart. And then you compare the list, you'll find substantial overlap. The trouble is the agencies haven't worked together. And these people were falling between the cracks. And, and, and the idea is that the bad news that these guys are so busy is also part of the good news. And that is, because they're so busy, you can get a hold of them. They give you handles, and you can pull levers to control. And David Kennedy has worked around in a variety of cities with this very exciting idea. That's the fourth big idea. And the fifth big idea 
is the uh, idea of Comstat. And more than anything else, Comstat is uh, uh, an accountability mechanism that uses as a tool uh, sophisticated crime analysis. And, uh, uh, but the basic principle there is that people are held, agents of social control, are held accountable for what they do. Something very new in cities like New York. I, I, I know nothing about the Phoenix or, the, or this area, but the idea that police ought to be doing something about crime uh, was simply alien. And it was, uh, they were more concerned about preventing corruption, but they didn't do a very good job in, in that as well because they were in the midst of a corruption scandal when Bratton took over. But it was this pr principle of accountability. These ideas were slowly g gaining momentum. And the first iteration of these ideas coming together was community policing during the 1980s. And, but, the, but the trouble with community policing during the 1980s, it was uncoupled from crime. Uh, and that is the influence of the 1965 President's Commission on Law, Enforc on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice put forward a theory of crime control that dominated schools of criminal justice, fortunately that's ending, dominated professional thinking. And that was crime was caused by poverty, racism, and social injustice. Police and criminal justice agencies couldn't do much about poverty, racism, and social injustice. Ergo, police couldn't do much about crime. And in the minds of police officers, community policing was soft policing. And they hated it. Uh, and in departments, you know, you'd go out and lecture, uh, and I don't see much of this anymore, but there were these guys, many guys, in the back row, they'd, they'd have their arms folded and they'd snicker when you'd talk about community policing. And the message was, I want to be a real cop and I want to deal with crime. And if some of you who have lectured the police know that you rarely see that anymore, although I, I did see it a couple of weeks ago. Um, in the 1990s, however, that the principles of community policing, which are nothing but the principles of Anglo-Saxon policing, and that is that uh, we need the community, the community is partners, we don't just do stroke jobs, we, just don't, we don't do community relations, we make partners of institutions, neighborhood groups, et, et cetera. More than anyone else, Bratton in New York City relinked community policing and crime. And community policing in the minds of police officers was soft policing. But when you think, but when you really think about that, you think about what constitutes aggressive policing. Now I'm not talking about ass kicking when I'm talking about aggressive policing. Think about Think about the old model of policing about riding around in cars and responding to calls for service. That is reactive policing. You're out there waiting for something to happen, and when it happens, you run, you, you run to take care of it, and the focus is on enforcing the law. What's happening as a result of Herman's ideas, other ideas, I think Broken Windows was, hey, the primary business of police is not to make an arrest after the fact. The primary business of police is to stop the next crime. Now, if you take that seriously, that's a radical reformation. If you think that the business of the police is to prevent crime, that means you have to start questioning all kinds of activities that police are involved in. And I would argue prosecutors, and I'll talk briefly about that, probation and parole as well, that the business of the criminal justice enterprise is to stop the next crime. And uh, 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 now, clearly, there has to be some kind of balance between that and law enforcement after the fact, because we are concerned about justice, and we want to push justice, and it is just that we really get the bad guys, and we want to get the bad guys for a variety of reasons, including the fact that when you put the bad guys in prison, they can't commit more crimes, at least, uh, except to uh, people who are in prison, pr prison with them. But this is a radical idea. But when you think about preventing crime, it means you're not waiting until something happens. It means you're taking action before the fact and doing something before the fact to stop the next crime. Now that's much more aggressive and it's much more intrusive. And I would add it's much more dangerous. Because the question can be raised, how intrusive do we want police to be? How am I doing with, is, is Dan here? How am I doing with time? Am, am I right yet? Uh, the, the question is, how, how intrusive do you want police to be? 
we have to be wary about that. And I, I think we're, we've clearly crossed the threshold. So now, in, in terms of, of a change in conception of policing and criminal justice from a reactive capacity only to a preventive capacity that uses law enforcement selectively, and that can be dangerous as well. You can hear the other words that could, could go in place of selectively uh, 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 to uh, limit offenders' uh, uh, offensive behavior. That, that was badly said. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Now, in terms of patrol, I think we know where we are and where we're going in patrol. It's quite clear in policing that um, patrol is going to be more and more focused around problems. Uh, basic principle of accountability, there's going to be geographic uh, accountability. Uh, that we know that uh, the meaning of offenses changes by neighborhood. We know that decisions have to be made at lower levels of the organization. That most of the problems will become the purview of, uh, purview of preventive uh, uh, activities become the responsibility of patrol. Uh, we're going to get more sophisticated about how to do that. Uh, um, and we're going to get better partnerships, et cetera. So patrol, I think we know where we are and where we're going. The key on that is prevention. We've got this big problem of what to do with 911, how to handle, uh, how to differentiate between genuine emergencies and how to manage non-emergencies. Uh, but I think we're at the end of understanding that the solution of every problem is to send a cop. And that is, we have defined police service unhappily as sending a cop. And during the 1970s, any of you who were around, I doubt it, during the 1970s, full police service meant responding to every call for service within three minutes. And what happened was that that goal created a, created a nightmare because uh, as police withdrew, as in my argument, as they withdrew from communities into cars to, to, to respond to calls for service, how much is that a time? I have, I have 30 minutes. I don't know whether that's good news or bad news for you, but anyway, I'm going to stop soon so we can have a conversation and uh, get some questions. But I warn you, I don't need questions to go on. So I, uh, I, hope, you, I, I hope you do have questions. Where I think the action is going to be now is in terms of criminal investigation, fusion centers, and, uh, 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 and problem solving at that level. And, 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 and let me talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, um, there was a fair amount of research in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, early 1980s, about criminal investigation. And basically, that research su suggested that as criminal investigation was conducted then, um, a, a good secretary could do most of the work of criminal investigators. Because most of the time, you knew who the bad guy was. Uh, the issue uh, was to make sure that you could demonstrate it in court, demonstrate it to a, uh, to a, to a prosecutor. And so uh, um, most of it was case preparation. And uh, uh, police detective units uh, were generally considered to be poorly managed. That is a sub substantially changed. Uh, you get cities that, that are doing a phenomenal job with retrospective criminal investigations. Milwaukee solves over 80% of its uh, uh, homicides, uh, even as the percentage of stranger to stranger homicide in, uh, uh, increases. Uh, I, I imagine uh, police departments around here could, uh, um, could give me similar, similar data. Um, uh, but one of the things that has struck me, and I had some, uh, I, 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 in, we put together in Newark a, a group of line investigators uh, in, in Newark, and I know it's similar uh, a areas here. You can tell where Irvington ends and Newark begins because there's a painted line on the street. Uh, in terms of socially, uh, there's, there's simply no demarcation. It's just, it's just an arbitrary political decision as to where the boundary is. And the tradition was to push, if, if, the, body was near the, if, if the body was near the line, the tradition was to push the body across the line. Uh, and I don't mean that uh, figuratively. I mean it literally. Uh, and um, so what we did was to put together a group of 
not unusual, of Newark police, Irvington police, and state police uh, to handle investigations, shooting investigations. And uh, what slowly became clear to me was that as they investigated cases, they were finding out information about community problems, but weren't using those data or making them available to anyone else. And what I discovered as well, watching this process, because homicides are investigated by prosecutors in New Jersey, prosecutors were doing the same thing. And that is, as you do the interviewing and interrogations and fact-finding about any particular event, you get a lot of data about surrounding problems. Because just as Herman argued that incidents are symptoms of problems, so many times homicide is a symptom of a problem. And you get, and when you investigate them, you get data about the problem as well as the particular case. But there's no capacity to use that. And, and, and as you know, in most police departments, uh, I know it's different here, but in most police departments, nobody shares information. They might trade information, but you share useless information when your reward system is based upon how many cases you solve. Now, uh, 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 again, I'm, 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 I'm certain it's different here, and I, and I want to push this too hard. But you add to that the new capacity of fusion centers. And Arizona, by the way, is anyone here from the fusion center? Uh, uh, Arizona, by the way, has been one of the leading states in, in, in the development of fusion centers. It seems to me a uh, fusion center is a, generally is a regional or statewide data information uh, analysis capacity that is in a position to operate between agencies and to make sure that, I, I mean, the problems of, uh, of data communication are, are rampant within policing and law enforcement. We generally think of bad communication as being a vertical issue, local police, FBI, et cetera, their, their level of communication. There's also a horizontal problem of communication, both within police departments and between police departments. Fusion centers are an attempt to solve this and, uh, uh, and to deal with this. And it was made more acute, of course, by, uh, by, by terrorism. And uh, from the very beginning, my concern was, uh, anyone here from the feds, FBI? Uh, well, then I can be a little bit freer. Uh, the, I mean, the FBI is the FBI. And they're going to stay the FBI. And in terms of thinking about the FBI in terms of prevention, they want to prepare cases. That's the way they're going to be. That's, that, that, that's it. And uh, my, uh, my sensitivity to the feds just acknowledges the nature of those organizations. And, and, and that is, the problem that they present is they can be a wonderful resource depending upon the agent in charge and the federal prosecutor. Uh, you get the right agent in charge, the right federal prosecutor, and you have a romance between local police departments, state police departments, that works very well. The problem is, however, it's completely, the level of cooperation is completely at the discretion of the feds. Now that means that you could get a change in the agent in charge and you don't get the kind of cooperation you have. Any prudent police chief under those circumstances is going to make up that he or she makes certain that they have a, a, capa a backup capacity. Ray Kelly uh, might have a wonderful relationship with the UA, US prosecutor in New York City. And he might have a wonderful relationship with this agent in charge, which he doesn't. But that is beside the point. The risk is they're not going to have the kind of cooperation, get the data, and their primary source of data is going to be CNN uh, regarding terrorism rather, or, or rather than the FBI. So they develop their own, own capacities. Fusion centers are an attempt to increase the, the ability between agencies and within agencies to share information. This is where I think the cutting edge in terms of research and practice is, uh, is, is going to be over the next 30, 40 years. Because just as we solve the problem, I think we have solved the problems of, of patrol. I think we know what has to be done. I think we've got to figure out the details. Uh, and, and I think the next revolution in terms of patrol is probably 30, 40 years away. Uh, uh, just like in the middle of the reform strategy during the 1970s, we couldn't think of anything other than rapid response and, and uh, uh, preventive patrol. I, I think we're in a new paradigm 
Uh, we're in the middle of it. We can't see much out of it. Uh, it's a strong paradigm. It's going to thrive. 30, 40 years from now, we'll be, we'll be able to enrich it or move beyond it. But right now, I think the primary focus is going to be on, uh, on criminal investigation and the problem solving at that level. Because, and, and I think most of you know, and I don't know how many of you, and I won't ask, are from an investigatory background. Uh, but most, uh, in, in most departments, the, uh, 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 the investigative capacity is pretty much sequestered, is not relating terribly well, uh, with, especially with patrol, sharing of information. And that is a problem that, that as we think about, uh, uh, about future conceptualizations of the criminal investigation and the prosecutorial function, I think preventively, I would use, the th I would use Malcolm Sparrow's phrase, Malcolm has got this wonderful phrase that part of the job is we want to sabotage uh, criminal planning. And, uh, um, and, and I, I think that's, the, that's a conceptualization uh, that uh, we ought to be thinking about in terms of getting criminal investigators to be working on, uh, on, uh, on solving problems. And I think fusion centers uh, can go a long ways I, I just in most communities, uh, in the community I'm working on in Milwaukee, you know, Milwaukee, the police department wants the data about released offenders to come on a regular basis. The state authorities want to give the data on a regular basis. They can't work it out. That's a natural for a fusion center to be able to handle in terms of that sharing of information, who's getting released, under what conditions, et cetera. Uh, in New Jersey for a long time, I know it's better now, uh, but, but until very recently, uh, the parole officers didn't even know who was going to get released. They found out somebody was being released when the person came in for the first uh, reporting. Anyway, finally, let me wrap up, and then we have some time left for questions, I think. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the future, as, as, uh, as I think you can tell. We're going to get some economic hits. Uh, uh, I think, nonetheless, safety, public safety, is so important. It is the basic uh, 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 function of, of government to make sure that other institutions can thrive. We have a lot of unused capacity inside of police departments. Uh, um, uh, it, it doesn't. It, it, uh, that doesn't mean I'm, 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 I'm saying that we should lower the number of police in police departments. I think. Uh, the research of the 1970s that suggested that the number of police department, number in a police department doesn't matter, was based on the fact that at that time police didn't know what they're doing. Police departments now know what they're doing and, and their numbers mean a lot. And I think that was demonstrated, uh, you know, in New York City, uh, if Bratton had a spike in crime, he could, in a geographical area, he could throw a thousand cops at it. In Los Angeles, he had trouble finding 50 cops to deal with Skid Row. Uh, and so, so, but nonetheless, we now know what we're doing, so we can target more. We can use our resources more flexibly. And so I think we're going to continue to see crime drops, except in one area. And I think we're going to still see a lot of, especially Hispanic and African Americans, killing each other. And that is, they're, they're going to be in the age group that Scott was talking about. Uh, it's going to be drug-related. And the killers and the killies are going to, it's going to be a luck of the draw because their patterns are, because their histories are very much the same. And that is going to be a problem that's going to be with us for a long time. And uh, 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 I think there are ways to deal with it, but I, I don't think, uh, I think we need a lot of problem solving thinking, especially on the part, part of criminal investigators. Because as most of you know, a lot of these shootings are revenge shootings that start a cycle of violence. And it seems to me, if, if one last example, uh, it's not very hard, given the technology we have, to identify in the middle of a gang who the real jerks are, who the real bad guys are. And if you concentrate, it isn't that hard to take them out. But if your plans stop at just taking out the bad guys, if you're not thinking about all the, all the wannabes, all the uh, possible fill-ins, all the rest in terms, of, uh, 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 in, in terms of managing those, I hear numbers like 80,000 gang members in, um, uh, in, in Los Angeles. I'm sure there are. I'm sure a small number of them are the real killers. And you go after those, but you also are thinking about what are the programs that we can pacify the rest. Because again, we forget, and I have a whole lecture on this, which I don't have time for, we forget about the persuasive powers of police and the pulling levers approach that David Kennedy ha has been developing. Uh, um, 
uh, I think we have to hone those skills to deal with that population. Uh, you get into communities in Newark for a long time, the response of the citizens was, let them kill each other. And this wasn't white citizens who were living outside. These were the citizens who were living in the middle of the chaos of these youths killing each other. But we know what that does, does to communities. Those are my comments. Uh, uh, questions, comments, raucous applause, uh, booze.